السلام عليكم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين It's my pleasure and honor to be here today with all of you. How are you all doing? So far, so good. MashaAllah, a wonderful conference, the AMAV conference that took place over the weekend. And the discussion on the symposium today, I hope, inshallah, will be fruitful for all of you. Um, my many thanks to Dr. Austin Padella and all the work that he's been doing here with Initiative in Islam and Medicine. Honestly, a uh, pioneer in this, especially for those of us who had been wanting to integrate the sciences, the ac in, uh, you know, in academia specifically, with Islamic background. So, certainly, thank you for starting the path here. Alhamdulillah. And also, um, thank you to Stephen, who's been doing a lot of work, and to Dr. Rosie as well. You know, your motto, or your, I should say, your emblem, the logo says Hakim. And the Hakim, you know, uh, of course, in a literal translation, is the wise one. But in the colloquial Arabic is often used as the word that's used for a physician. So uh, somebody in the Arab world may say, when they say, I'm going to go see a doctor, they'll say, I'm going to visit the Hakim. And Hikmah has the same, of course, root word, wisdom. It has the same root, and I was thinking and reflecting on the wisdom of what Dr. Asim asked me to speak on because he asked me to address the topics, the three priority areas that have been discussed this year in the conference. So mental health, reproductive health, and sexual health. And I thought to myself, the hikmah in coming full circle. Because for me, I, and Allah Ta'ala, you know, alam, because we plan and Allah plans and Allah's the best of planners but I was the accidental psychiatrist who was supposed to become an OB. <laughs> and to the point that all of my uh, training and all my advanced rotations were actually in the field of obstetrics and gynecology. To the point that when I came to apply for residency, my letters of recommendation still set on them obstetrics. So I'm interviewing at psychiatry residency programs at the Stanfords and the Harvards and the Mayo Clinics and such, and they're <laughs> telling me, so do you want to become a psychiatrist or an obstetrician? <laughs> and I'm in these very awkward moments trying to explain what all happened that changed the course of direction. But subhanAllah, that, um, and that's a long story, and I won't go into all the details on how that happened. But in the short version of the story, here is where I have to thank my husband, because at the time, both of us had been trained our primary training is actually in Islamic law and theology and had been teaching in the community. And in the process of teaching, it became very clear to us that there were so many things happening in the community that we didn't have words to explain despite our Islamic training. We didn't understand pathology, for example. We didn't understand what was normal, typical behavior and what was pathological behavior that needed help. But as people who are religious leaders in the community, you're often given everything to work with, even if you don't have that specific training. And so he said to me, any trained person can deliver a baby. But only somebody who's really grounded in the Islamic training could actually help the course of psychiatric and mental illness and really be able to integrate both from our tradition. And hence, this, my course of training changed, alhamdulillah. Full circle in that today's discussion is actually going to integrate the things that I care very deeply about, all of them, all three things. And my advanced training actually happens to be in my fellowship training post-residency, is actually in women's health and wellness. And so even till today, I'm still embedded once a week in an OBGYN clinic where there's five OBGYNs and I'm the one psychiatrist that's working with perinatal maternal and female health. So SubhanAllah, and I'll do my best in today's discussion to bring in some of those themes, but because I'm primarily speaking as a psychiatrist, the lens will be primarily mental health. But the full circle, so thank you for that invitation, mashallah. And you know, here, I think we should start the discussion in really um, understanding the, the work that's happening right now for us in the field of mental health, you mentioned the Khalil Center, and the work that we're trying to do to really integrate Islamic fundamental teachings and understandings into what seems to be for many a very secularized field. Particularly when we think about this schism that seems to exist in the field of the sciences where there seems to be this division 
between science and religion. And there always seems to be this tension, should these two worlds integrate or not? And as a Muslim, this is always hard for me and for folks like you who know that in our Islamic teachings, there is no division between these lines. Our scholars have always integrated and worked within the sciences and the faith all as one package. It wasn't this tension that exists in the modern, particularly medical world, but in the modern other domains and fields as well. So here, you know, I really want to talk about um, some concepts in which there are ethical dilemmas that show up when you train in the modern fields of psychology and psychiatry. Let's start there. But there are things that don't jive with the Islamic understanding. So what happens? What do you do? So the first story and case that I'll share with you actually highlights two terms that are very important to our field of mental health and in specifically in counseling that often cause some ethical dilemma. These are the terms called transference and countertransference. And I'll explain those momentarily. But first, to explain what I mean, I'll share with you the story of my very first day. <laughs> I told you that I wasn't planning on going into psychiatry to begin with, and so I kept my psychiatry rotation in medical school until towards the end of my training. And on my very first day, in my very first experience in a psychiatric institution with my very first formal interview of a psychiatric patient, so I was sent to a patient who was on an inpatient locked unit. She, would, she was at the very end of the hallway, and I went there. We were each assigned a patient, and I went there to, to do my interview skills. I emerged maybe an hour later and took my notes, copious notes, as a very green medical student might do, <laughs> to, the, uh, to the attendings and the rest of the medical students, and the, each one is presenting the case that they had worked on. When it came my turn, I got up and I presented, you know, Miss So-and-so is a 20-some-year-old, you know, patient with A, B, and C history that presents for X, Y, Z, and on with the rest of the discussion. The two attendings, the two supervising attendings in the room, kept looking at each other the whole time I'm presenting. And I couldn't figure out what was I saying that was problematic or why were they looking at each other. And then after they let me give my whole spiel, <laughs> the first attending says to me, did Mrs. So-and-so really say all of that? <laughs> I was like a deer caught in the headlights, like, oh no. What did I say? What did I do? Did I mess this up? All those thoughts are going through my head. It's my first, my first psychiatric interview. And the other attending jumps in and says, actually what he means to say is, Mrs. So-and-so has been in our unit for three weeks now and has not been willing to speak to a single one of us. Not any of the doctors, not any of the nurses, not any of the techs, nobody. How did she say all of those things to you? So now that pit in your stomach that's like, am I being accused here <laughs> of falsifying this interview? Mashallah. And then one of them, they saw I was just sort of like stuck. And they, so one of them said, did she say anything to you that indicated why she would speak to you and not to anyone else? And I said, I, I don't know, but I remember her saying that she, um, in the point where we got to her educational history, she said that as a girl, she attended a Catholic school in which there were all nuns. And that she, that period of her life was the most um, helpful and positive period of her life, and that she had this very positive affiliation with her, uh, the nuns who were her teachers. And she said to me, you remind me of them. So when the one attending raised his hands up and said, positive transference. And the other attending raised his hand and said, the nun effect. <laughs> and I just said, what are those? <laughs> I was terrified, really. And all I could stammer was, but I'm not a nun, you know, and they just laughed and they kind of went through, <laughs> they went through this whole discussion of explaining what transference was. And here is an example of a positive transference, because what transference is, is in our counseling world is a term we use when the patient or the client is having a good connection or a vibe basically with the therapist or doctor who is in the room who is trying to help them. Now, as you can imagine, there's also a negative transference that can happen the other way around, where they are something about me as a practitioner is actually triggering 
to them, and they are not willing to talk, and they're not willing to actually open up. Now, that's transference, but there's also counter-transference. And counter-transference is when I, as a clinician, there is something about the patient in the room that is bothering me or triggering me or not allowing me to be as objective as I should be in working with that patient, right? And so we're taught in our field to be very careful of these concepts of transference and counter-transference because, as one of my mentors would say, Dr. Harold Koning is um, a very prolific author in the field and researcher in the field of um, spirituality and health, and particularly in mental health. He's at Duke University. And he has several books, many, many books. One of them is a book called Spirituality and Patient Care. And in there, he talks about how the mental health provider, compared to all the other medical providers, are held to a much more narrow and restrictive um, ability in what they can and cannot say to the patient or client in front of them. The reasoning he gives is because if we're not careful about crossing boundaries, and not just our own, crossing boundaries into the patient care, or are allowing also not stopping the patient when they cross boundaries into our space, then we lose the ability to actually give them the best care possible. And while, especially for us psychiatrists who are trained as MDs, you know, in medicine, we are trained to be very decisive in what we say. Doctor, do I have cancer or not? What antibiotics works well? What are the side effects? What are, you know, so you're trained to be able to say, you know, and you, there's, of course, there's shades of gray. You're trained on how to say that as well. But it, they're expecting very specific answers from you. But in the field of psychiatry, and specifically counseling psychology, you cannot speak that freely. That's one layer of difficulty. Now add to that the next layer of what happens if in addition to that, you are working with a Muslim patient, you are a Muslim psychiatrist or psychologist. And because of that shared faith background, they're also expecting you to, in addition to have answers to the medical or illness kind of questions they're asking, of also having Islamic answers. Now comes another layer of complexity of what can you say that does not actually interfere with the therapeutic process that is happening in that therapy room. And that can also aid it and help it, not the other way around. So now that I've prefaced the discussion, let's talk about some more specific cases of when this starts to show up and how exactly you, um, we have been struggling really to work on this. Like where is the role of bioethics, right? What is the role of ethics? in these situations? Where is the role of the Muslim scholars in this situation? And then the role of those who are being trained. So here's an example. Let's start with this first example. You know, for those who are trained in Islamic law here in the room, there are certain maxims in our faith which we know very well, but may not be as obvious right away to the person who's in the room with us. For example, in therapy, this has happened a number of times now, where a patient may say to me, um, I, uh, either, either she's saying it's something in passing, or that is the actual, the crux of the issue for which she's presenting, and each one differs. So here's a case. The patient comes in and says, she's talking about something totally different, and saying, you know, maybe let's say the issue is really her work situation. My boss is giving me trouble with this. I'm having trouble with my coworkers here. I'm thinking of changing jobs. I need your support and help. That is the context with which she's speaking. And that's what she's seeking therapy for. Now, in the middle of all of that <laughs> comes this one-liner, where in the middle of her describing how difficult life has been lately, she says something like, and then I've decided to go on birth control pills, but I'm not telling my husband because I just, it's too much. I can't handle all this that's happening. And on goes the rest of the conversation. For the trained ear in Islamic law, you hear this line and go, oh, <laughs> this cringe that happens of you know something was just said that is not necessarily in accordance to the teachings of Islam, and she may be very oblivious to that. It may not be purposeful. But she also hasn't asked for help with it, nor asked anything related to that particular topic. Unlike the other patient who comes in specifically to say, Life has been really difficult lately. I have, I don't know, let's, let's say five children under the age of six. 
you know? And I am tired, I am anemic, I can't sleep at night, I have no help, my hair is falling out, and the list goes on and on and on. And in the midst of all that, she says, and I feel really guilty because I decided to go back on birth control pills, but I'm not telling my husband, or I don't want to tell my husband because he would say no, but I just can't right now, but I feel so guilty over it. Doctor, what do I do? Hmm. Now, each woman's story is different because the one who went on was just talking about her work and she says that one liner and then goes right into my boss and my coworkers and my job and, and wants help with that. What is the role of the person who was dually trained, who was there in the room as a therapist? That's the point of coming in. She's not catching me after my Friday night halakha saying to me, hey, Dr. Rania, what is the ruling on? That, that wasn't the context. The context is she's in a therapy room. And the, what she's seeking help for is what? All my issues happening at work. Do I pull that conversation back and say, hey, by the way, which our field would say, no, that would be egregious. That would be crossing boundaries. Unlike the other woman over here who's saying what? This is the crux of my problem, and I need to untangle it because that's why I feel so guilty. Now help me through the situation. So she knows the ruling, and she knows she's doing something that is not. And for anybody in the room who's wondering, what is this ruling? <laughs> so let me clarify, just in case. The ruling in Islam is that neither spouse should prevent purposefully prevent the other spouse from having access or having a child. And just like the man cannot do something that either permanently or even temporarily prevents the woman from having children, she also cannot do something that prevents him, especially if it's um, permanent for either one of them, but even temporary, without a discussion back and forth and a decision between them. Now, this is the ideal case. This is what Islamic law teaches. And here comes the situation where, but that's too complicated. They're not seeing eye to eye in the first place. So what are we talking about here? Here we're talking about issues of ethical dilemma that start to show up in the context of therapy. And like I said, there's many layers to this story. Because either you have a practitioner uh, uh, sorry, a patient who comes in, a client or patient who comes in, who's not seeking out any, they're not coming to you because of anything related to the Muslim faith. In fact, they may not be necessarily, that's not really the, what they're interested in. That's not what they're seeking you out for. Unlike the patient who may come out to you, like we see in the Khalil Center, the vast majority of people who seek out, and the Khalil Center is a spiritually integrated professional counseling service. So these are clinics that are now, mashallah, throughout the country. They started off here in Chicago, and we have branches in the Bay Area, in LA, in New York, in Toronto, and inshallah, growing. So this concept of seeking out specifically mental Muslim, mental health providers who are not just Muslim, but they're actually also doing what? If requested, what? If requested, will also do a form of therapy that's called Islamically Integrated Psychotherapy. So if somebody seeks that form of therapy out, they are also asking for Islam to be integrated into the therapy ruling. So the patient is saying, help me figure out both Islamically but also emotionally how to deal with this case. Now you start to see where the fields start to have a little bit of a tension with each other. Do I put on my hat or hijab <laughs> of being a you know, psychiatrist only in this case, or do I also lend expertise towards the Islamic sciences in this case? Well, the first thing I'll say to you is the patient or the client has to be the one to lead the discussion. What is it that they want? And that's where we go. But in the meantime, there may be something that they said in the process of therapy that in my personal religious practice might be very difficult to stomach or hear. And so we are taught if you have that level of counter-transference, right, that level of difficulty working with somebody who may be doing something that you, it, for whatever reason, it's triggering to you as a clinician, you are taught ethically to transfer them to another provider because then you cannot give objective good care if, that's, if your lens is too cloudy in that way. So now, Let's, let's keep going in this discussion because I want to tell you, and for those of you in the room who are trained in Islamic sciences, you may be hearing this and going, but wait, wait. 
How could somebody who is trained in Islamic law allow some of this to keep going? Because that's just one example, and we have many, many. But just one example, because you know, let's talk about the framework of Islamic law. For example, you know, I'm going to use some Arabic words and I'll, I'll translate them. But in the framework of Islamic law, once you are trained, there has to be, for example, a series of several things that happen. The first, to bian al-hukum. Right? So basically giving clarification to the ruling when someone asks you about that ruling. And if you don't, what happens is something called kitman al-ilm, right? that you are doing what? You are actually um, covering up knowledge, concealing knowledge, which is considered to be impermissible to the person who has been trained in this field. So there causes the dilemma for that person. And then there's other aspects. For example, this concept of the obligation of advising, which is what? Wujub al nasiha which correspond with the rules or ahkam al hisba The ahkam al hisba is basically the rules where you enjoin good and forbid evil. So if, again, if someone's asking you this very, very directive question and you are actually trained in this and you have the answers and you purposefully do not answer, here comes an issue for the person who's actually been trained in Islamic law or theology. So, and conveying the deen in general, this obligation of conveying the deen, you know, the, pro, the, the uh, you know, the saying, or uh, bismillah, بَلَّغُ عَنِّي وَلَوْ آيَةً, right? So convey, even if it's just an about me, even if it's just one verse. So here, this concept of this framework looks very different than the framework over here. If I give you the framework of psychiatry, for example, or of the mental health and the counseling fields, which basically says, we are not here to give you directive answers to anything that you bring up in therapy. We are here to do something called, and these are psych terms, called hold and contain. Hold and contain is whatever you bring into the room, I am meant to hold it with you to help you with this thing, whatever, however heavy it is, and to help you walk along the path and guide you when needed and as needed by the questions that I might ask and by the exercises that I may teach you and techniques that I may teach you to help guide you on the path. But it's never a directive, you should do this or you shouldn't do that. So very different than the other framework that I just spoke about. So here, when you, um, to really the idea here is to inspire people to make the best choices for themselves, that you can't make decisions for them as a therapist in the room. So here you are um, having this discussion. And by the way, I just have to say, this is where I really love, I didn't name the Khalil Center, Dr. Human, who will be here later, came up with the term Khalil Center. But it comes from the word Khalil in Arabic, which is basically the friend, and has other translations too. But the Khalil, you know, like the hadith that says, al-mar'u ala dini khalili, right? A person is on the deen, or on the path, of their good friend. And therapists are not meant to be friends, by the way. What I meant to explain here is somebody who walks, walks along the path with you is your Khalil, right? So that's how we see, Islamically, how we see a therapist in this modern kind of discussion of Islamic psychotherapy is the, what we determine the Khalil to be, someone who's walking along the path and as needed kind of help guide you towards the questions, but it's never very directive. So. All of that being said, now we have this you know, kind of issue of what happens in this case I just discussed you, with you. Because I'll tell you something very important. There are so many people coming through the pipeline of mental health. So just like I had no, no plan to be a psychiatrist, and I'll be the first one to say, I had my own internalized stigma towards mental health. I didn't take a single psychology course in college because what good Muslim girl does such a thing? Remember, I trained in Islamic sciences before I trained in medicine. So for me, that was the frame, and I'll be very honest with you. So when people have all this stigma against mental health, I, I know exactly where you're coming from. I was once there. And Allah has a way of humbling you. MashaAllah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. And so, you know, finding that path and understanding, and this is a whole other discussion we don't have time for today, but the discussion of how so much of mental health is part of our legacy as Muslims and our heritage as Muslims, that's usually what I'm always talking on and on and on about, <laughs> which inshallah we'll have that discussion on another time and day. But 
when I realized how much it was part of our heritage, then it made sense to me. And then came the question, well, how did our predecessors deal with these questions? Because every time you pick up a biography of any of the early Islamic scholars that wrote on what today we call mental health, and you read their biography, it always starts off with, and so-and-so had studied the Islamic sciences and memorized the Quran, and, da, 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 and then he studied medicine, and then he wrote it, and then he studied this, and he studied that, and the other thing. Encyclopedic scholars. So clearly, they had grounding in the dean before they had grounding, in, or along with the grounding they had in medicine and the sciences too. So clearly, these are not new ethical conundrum, right? This is something that we think is new, but it's not actually. So I actually urge us to go back to our tradition and figure out exactly how to have this all work out properly. But let me give you another example, because the examples, like I said, they're endless. They're endless. Whether we talk about the example of, you know, you're the therapist in the room and the person, this actually happened to me just recently. I had a patient, she's talking to me on and on about the difficulties of, there was financial difficulties in the family and there were issues related to her and her husband weren't getting along, there's a young child and, you know, just that's kind of the, what's happening. And then the next session I see her, which was two weeks later, she's coming in and she's an emotional wreck. I mean, crying nonstop. What's wrong? What happened? When she could finally get the word, she said, as soon as I left here, soon the day after I left the session, I found out I was pregnant. My husband and I both decided we couldn't have this child. I went to Planned Parenthood. I had an abortion, and I'm a wreck. Right? These are practicing Muslims. I mean, that's not the issue here. <laughs> the issue is this is someone's real life scenario. So she's talking in the room about being guilt ridden about what had happened and wanting to, needing to talk through that space. I am not there to judge. I'm not there to say haram. I'm not there to say shame on you. I'm there to help her through this process because the reality is it didn't come up in our earlier sessions for us to even have a discussion about it. Now had it, maybe we could have had a discussion, maybe the result would have still been the same. And maybe that was the proper result for her, I don't know. But what I do know is that if it's something that a person has, ha has ha it happens, depending on your comfort, because if for me, that's too much for me to handle, then I need to transfer her out to somebody else that can help her, right? Now, these cases, whether they're on abortion, maybe it's adultery for that matter, maybe it's anything that may be considered problematic with the Islamic faith, it's going to do what? Require us to really think, how do we bring in the ethics into this discussion? So here's another example for all of us in the room. I know we have many uh, health providers in the room. But you know, it's really important to understand that in the therapy space, it's a very unique space, different than other fields of medicine. Because we cannot, we are, un, we are not allowed to give unsolicited advice. So she's in the middle of saying all that, and I can't just unsolicitedly say, oh, you know, <laughs> you shouldn't have done that, right? Like, no, that's not the space for that, um, even if that is actually the ruling. So imposing kind of these uh, religious values, especially on someone, especially on someone who didn't even ask you about it, because the same person could have come in and didn't feel guilty, felt that that was the right decision for her, and now she wants to talk about something totally different. I want to talk about you know the difficulty I'm having, like the person who had difficulty at work, let's say, right? So you cannot just like intervene and say something else in the middle of, um, but it, it's difficult because here in the context of this therapeutic alliance that deforms. It's, it's, it's hard for those who are kind of trained in multiple fields, if you will, especially if they're also trained in the Islamic field. And all these people coming through the pipeline, we want them to be grounded in the faith. So that when Muslim patients come through and say, I need guidance on, I'm coming to you specifically because you're a Muslim like me, therefore we speak the same language, <laughs> right? I don't mean actual language, I mean lived experience language, okay? And that's why I'm seeking you out. We have to be very careful in how we say what we say. So here's another example, and the, uh, here, you know, um, and this has happened also a number of times, myself and other people I supervise at the Cleo Center, you know, we do a lot of marriage family counseling, a lot of it. And I can't tell you now the number of times this has happened either to me or someone I supervise where they're in the middle of talking about, you know, let's say it's a, the context of a 20-year marriage or even a five-year marriage for that matter, but it's like this very disjointed like timeline and then this happened and she said this and he did this and then they came here and then this one happened and this kid was happening and this one and it's just like and you're trying really hard to follow this you know, timeline of this person's life basically and when you finally get it all down, it becomes really clear again to the trained ear that these two people Islamically, are no longer married. But they're living together, 
and they're working through. In fact, what they came for was marriage therapy to help them. And now you're in this dilemma of, do I say something about how that was the final talaq or divorce? You're way past three. Or maybe it was a non raja I don't want to get into too many legal <laughs> terminology here, but it was a non-returning, uh, you, you know, into the marriage. Do I say or do I not say? And then ethically, as a therapist, do I continue counseling them in marriage when Islamically they're no longer married? What a total ethical dilemma. So here you are in the space of therapy. And what we figured out is the level of training differs. So if you are somebody who's actually been trained, and I'll tell you some of the ways you might kind of in very, in very sensitively ask these questions to see where, again, you are walking along the path with them. But when there's an ethical conundrum, you are not what? meant to have to sit in a very difficult situation if you can't handle that situation. Nevertheless, you might want to very well be able to help your clients, your patients. So at the Khalil Center, we developed something called religious consultants. So now, because what we realize is some of our therapists are trained. They've actually gone through their legal studies. They've gone through madrasa studies. They've gone through you know, different kinds of studies. And they have within themselves, with the same body, they have the professional therapy training and the Islamic, Islamic uh, law training. But for many of our therapists, they're in the process of training or they don't have this. So this is where we have our in-house religious consultants, where we basically have said, when an issue like this comes up to the therapist, when an issue like this comes up, do not attempt to answer if you do not have the correct and requisite knowledge to say anything Islamically about whether or not this is actually, but if you have doubts, what you heard and you're like, this is, this is, this, you know, there's no way these two people Islamically are still married and you have doubts on that, then you say to them, would it be permissible, would it, would it be okay for me to refer you to our religious consultants? Why? Because I'm wondering if we need to sort out some of the religious aspects, the fiqhi aspects, right, the legal aspects of whether the two of you are actually married or not. I don't know enough. This is what a therapist might say. But the religious consultant can help you sort this out. So here in Chicago, we have Maulana Bilal Ansari. In California, we have Sheikh Rami Ansur. We have some other, you know, in each of our, we have people, some of whom are separate religious consultants. And there are some of us who are dually trained, myself, for example, in the Bay office or Sheikh Sohail Mullah, who's in the LA office, who have both trainings, right? To be able to help discern what's happening. Now, most of our clients, actually I would say, I haven't seen a case yet in which they weren't very thankful for that. Because they're, again, the reason they're seeking out this specific type of care is because they want the Islamic understanding and framework, right? Mostly. Now we have, by the way, just to be very, very, very clear, we have non-Muslims in our office all the time, okay? And we cater to everybody. And we have lots of Muslims in our office who don't want the Islamic paradigm. They just want regular standard therapy, but know that you have the same cultural background as them. And everybody is welcome. <laughs> I'm talking about the subset of people who what? Who specifically are asking for both together, the Islamic understanding plus the therapy. So we, we try to help ameliorate some of this with our Islamic, with our um, religious consultants, right? But I also want to say, and this is what we do with our training with regular therapy training, and we always tell people, be careful not to speak on what you do not know, because you can make the situation 10 times exponentially worse. Do you know what I mean? And so in the process of all this, the back and forth and back and forth either, because now as a therapist, in this case I just mentioned, if they are married, now your role as a marriage family therapist is to do what? Is to actually help them get on good footing in that marriage. And if they are actually divorced, maybe the therapy has to take a different you know, path where it actually helps them each figure out how to get on their feet as a divorced person and how to figure out co-parenting and all the rest that comes with that. Right? And if they wish to remarry, that has a different type of therapy that needs to happen. So you see, one simple thing, either, and this is a process too, where someone could just say it in passing, and not even, that's not even the reason they came to you in the first place, or that may be the very reason they came. Right? And so this is where I want to show you the different layers of ethical conundrum <laughs> that happens sometimes in our field of mental health that still kind of have, you know, I'm touching a little bit on the reproductive and sexual health discussion as well here. But you know, I really want to um, share with you these, these, the difficult 
these are difficult cases. And I really want you to think about how that really um, affects both the people in the room who are trying to help, but also affects us, right, as the people trying to do the help. And how important it is to really be as grounded and as trained as possible and to have the kind of supervision that is required. Because you see, in the field of mental health, I'll just speak of that field, any, you know, anybody, even a master's level trainee, is going to go through not just two years of a master's program, but they typically have about 3,000 hours or more of supervised clinical care. That's about three more years, give or take, of actual supervision over the therapy they're doing, meaning somebody else has to sign off in every case that they have until they're really well grounded and trained to then be able to do this solo. So I'm going to take a small segue here and say for all of us who are all of our dear Islamic studies and Islamic uh, and imams and Islamic um, studies and religious teachers, you know, these things that we call counseling, kind of informal counseling, is also somewhat problematic when just like all those people that have had years and years and years and years of training to be careful of how they say things and how to frame things and what to do, but they may not have the Islamic knowledge. The requisite, but the imams and, and religious and scholarly leaders might on this side have the requisite knowledge, but don't have the training and the nuance of what you say and how you say and when you say it, right? So preferably, there's train, there's cross training, <laughs> right? Cross training that happens where there's training for imams on the mental health field, which alhamdulillah we have and we've developed specific. I think Khalil Center has the, the specific imam training on how to actually speak. Other organizations have as well, but this is written by people who have both the scholarly lens, so that when they do the training, the scholars are actually listening <laughs> because it's speaking their language, right, to be able to really fully understand what's happening. And likewise, our mental health providers and professionals have to have some requisite, you know, trainings that explain the Islamic side of things too so they're not misstepping and crossing boundaries they shouldn't be crossing either. We often talk about this issue of staying in your own lane. And people don't like this <laughs> very much, but the reality is if you try to drive and not stay in your own lane, what's going to happen? Well, this is what happens. This is what happens here too, right? So, you know, and I could share some other uh, cases and maybe we'll have, you know, time for that as well later. But, you know, just think about all the different cases in which um, there really is. And I, I just very briefly mentioned abortion, but certainly it is a case that causes quite a bit of ethical conundrum as well. And somebody who's in the counseling space may have a really difficult time, you know, if they feel very strongly that this is not, or maybe they don't have the full requisite knowledge because the ruling is known, but there's all this nuance in the fiqh that may or may not allow for somebody to actually undergo abortion. Islamically, I'm talking requisite knowledge Islamically. So, you know, you really have to think about all the different layers that comes up in this discussion and how important all this uh, cross-training needs to uh, needs to happen. And I also want to say that sometimes in therapy we have to be very careful in sitting with <laughs> um, and working on cases that actually may, uh, somebody may say something in the context of therapy that very much, to, again, to the trained religious ear may sound like ridda. Somebody has just exited the fold of Islam by what they just said. But you are not there to be the judge or jury or executioner, right? You are there to actually help. And if they were to turn around and say, what I said there, is that problematic with Islam? That's a different discussion than the person who's saying that. And sometimes I'll actually say to some of my patients who say things that are, you might even consider as blasphemous, you know, Islamically, but I'll say to them, it sounds like your depression's talking. And they'll say, what? And I say, you know, when we're depressed, sometimes we say things. We have such a despondent state and we say things that later when we're out of that state, we may actually not identify with, right? And they may ask, what do I mean? And we might go back and forth and actually have a discussion on the importance of, uh, of understanding that uh, there's no judgment of what you say right now. But if we're trying to help you through that case, then either I'm going to refer to some of our um, spiritual leaders to help in that, or if I, and I have permission to help as well, walk along the path with you, if that person is asking for help along that path, will actually do so to help, you know, in those, um, in this, uh, you know, therapy that they're seeking. 
So in closing, I think what I want to say here is I really feel that one of the main places where the, our ethicists can really help us, and I'll tell you, again, because of that, so many providers that are coming through the pipeline. I, I think I started by saying, at the time I went through training, there were very few of us, <laughs> very, very few, to the point that when I finished my training, so here I am, a newly minted psychiatrist, and I finished the training, I only knew one, maybe two people in the entire Bay Area region who were, were also Muslim and in mental health. And I said to them, let's just meet and see what happens. So we sent out a message into cyberspace and said, you know, if any of you are Muslim and mental health providers, we're going to have a monthly meeting at Stanford. Come join us. The very first meeting, there were 10 people. Nobody knew anybody else, but for the most part. Literally, we're all looking at everyone else going, who are you? And where did you come from? And you were down the street. I had no idea. You're in this field, too? And it was like, you know, talk about a real process group. <laughs> you know? Everyone felt that they were an island all by themselves. And as the months went on, this became a monthly meeting. That, and now we're called the Bay Area Muslim Mental Health Professionals Network. And every month that, met, that we met, the numbers kept growing and growing, doubling and then tripling and quadrupling, <laughs> mashallah, until it became an actual, you know, steady group of people. And what's really wonderful out of those initiatives is that it became really clear to me how many more people were coming through the pipeline that once they came to the other end and they really wanted to work with the Muslim community, but they didn't have a lot of training in how to actually engage the community either, right? And what they were trained in was a very, very Western secular lens. And they knew that too, <laughs> and they wanted that help and kind of get coming through. And for those who are reaching out for that kind of help, hence the, the trainings that we're doing, for example, with the Khalil Center of what? Of integrating Islam with professional therapy for those who wish to have that. And there is a very strong subset of our community who does. So in, in closing here, I'll just say here that um, just like our ethicists have worked, and especially our bioethicists have worked quite a bit on the fatawa related to, relating to things like abortion or relating to fertility-based questions, you know, sperm bank or not, you know, things like this. I, I also think that here there are very important fatawa and uh, d Islamic discussions that need to happen, especially for all of our trainees that are coming through the pipeline who are one day going to be psychologists and psychiatrists and social workers and uh, professional licensed therapy, uh, therapists. We, they're going to need some really developed manuals and developed guidelines on how to answer and work with our patients, this particular patient population of the Muslim segment of the population. And I really encourage our ethicists to help us and our Islamic scholars to help us. And that likewise, know that even though it's a, we, we're talking about being in your own lane, know that the lane is, is bi-directional. There are two, <laughs> there are two, you know, it's a two-way road. Right? or maybe three or four for that matter. And so we need people to really be cross-collaborating to come up and be able to answer some of the best, um, in the best way, you know, give the best practices for what will be, continue to be ethical dilemmas from the beginning till the end here. So with that, inshallah, I'll close. And if we have time for questions, I'll take them. Barakallahu feekum. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.